Chapter 1 Maximum Giraud, Witness of the Apparition The great event of the apparition of the Mother of God at La Salette on September 19, 1846, is based on the consistent testimony of two children, which was confirmed by miracles. Within the first three years, 253 miracles occurred, apart from the greatest one of all, the sudden arrival of 60,000 pilgrims on the first anniversary on a barren mountain which was difficult to reach. We will see to what extent Maximum's testimony contributed to the official approval of the apparition, to the erection of the Basilica of Our Lady of La Salette, and to the spreading of its devotion in the Church. The favorable outcomes which have resulted from the apparition must be attributed to him, for if he had neither spoken nor acted, La Salette would have been forgotten by now. Already in just the first two years, more than 300,000 pilgrims flocked to La Salette to hear Maximin, as well as Melanie, who lived near him in Cor, in the school of the Sisters of Providence. We will study the events that occurred in the first four years following the apparition, supporting these with some comments and conclusions. Maximin was the first to recount the miraculous event, to erect the first cross on the site of the apparition, and to lead the first pilgrims there who were charmed by his story and captivated by his sweet, innocent nature. As soon as he came down from the mountain, the shepherd of La Salette rushed ahead of Melanie to the home of her employer to relate to Mother Pratt what had filled his heart, his heart with heavenly emotion. When Mother Pratt of the village of Aplandans heard him speak of a lady of fire as bright as the sun, she called him a little fool. But at the end of the story, in which she heard Maximum repeat calmly but adamantly the words and threats of the beautiful lady, her eyes filled with tears. She stood there near the fireplace where she was preparing the evening supper, as though petrified. Upon leaving, the child said to her, If you don't believe me, Melanie, your shepherdess, who was with me, will tell you the same thing. From there, Maximum went to his employer, Father Selmy's, two employers? Father Selmy's house, who in his own handwriting recorded the domestic scene of this truly patriarchal household where the master, who was already aware of the conversation held in his neighbor's house, had set a place for the shepherd at the family table. When the meal was over, the old man took off his vest and ordered his shepherd to tell all, in the presence of all his servants and neighbors, who had hurried to his house because of the incident. The child spoke at ease, while all listened attentively. They began calling it a miracle, and even believed and the eyes of those good country folks teared up when they heard that the harvest would spoil. Maximin was only saying what Melanie would write in her famous booklet published in French, which received an imprimatur from Bishop Zola on November 15, 1879, and of which several million copies were subsequently reproduced in various languages, at least in relation to the public discourse of the Weeping Virgin. However, from the very first hour, there were skeptics in the audience who dared to smirk and shake their heads. The good Father Selmy quickly brought these village nationalists to their senses with admirable reasoning, enlightened by faith, saying, quote, The boy is incapable of inventing such things. The beautiful lady is not a soul in purgatory because she does not ask for prayers for herself, but to hold back the arm of her son. Nor can she be a good witch, for witches do not ascend to the highest heavens, but cast spells on us and wish us harm instead of good." Unquote. The evening ended peacefully with this advice from Father Selmy to his little servant, whom he had brought back with all his family members to the house of Melanie's employer. Tomorrow, Sunday, you and Melanie will go tell everything to the priest. Melanie would only need to confirm what Maximin would say. The two shepherds rose early and departed together for the parish. Maximum was the first to speak and said to the old priest's housekeeper, who was in her room at the time, 
quote, we wish to speak to the priest at once, unquote. Quote, first tell me what you want with the priest. I will tell him after, the old lady retorted. Obliged to comply, Maximum began his account of the previous evening with Melanie present, who confirmed it. The housekeeper, who was kneeling before the fire she was kindling, paused in awe, emotional and overjoyed. She was almost unable to speak, which allowed the narrator to speak calmly. He was about to finish when the 80-year-old priest, who had heard everything from his room, came running, raising his arms to heaven. Quote, Oh, how fortunate you are, my children. You have seen the Blessed Virgin. The good priest even had tears in his eyes. How true is it that the holy priest instinctively sensed the supernatural? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Sensum Christi, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Seeing the emotion of her pious pastor, who believed beyond doubt in the miracle, Melanie turned to Maximum and said, Wasn't I right to believe that it was the good God of the Blessed Virgin? After Mass, during which Father Jacques Perrin told the great news amidst sobs which made him barely audible, Maximum and Melanie, who had only known each other for two days, parted and did not meet for three consecutive months. Judging by the validity of the testimony of the two shepherds, who never contradicted each other, who unknowingly always supported each other, and who would not have had enough time together to concoct a scheme, merits our attention. Melanie went back to her employers at the Ablandens, while Maximin's employer took him back to his father's house in Cor, as previously agreed. On arrival at his father's house, they found only Maximum's stepmother, who had been reared who had reared him because he had lost his mother at 18 months of age. Father Selmy took it upon himself to explain what had happened to Mr. Giraud's son. He told the same story to the child's father, himself at the tavern where he had gone to find him. So it was that Maximum had little more to do the first day except to confirm the words of the good villager, Selmy. The news of the apparition spread throughout the village like wildfire. Maximum went to tell his grandmother, who already knew something, about the Saturday's marvelous event. She ordered him to repeat everything again in front of the growing crowd of people who were flooding in on this Sunday when people usually rested. No sooner had the child obeyed his grandmother than he ran off to play with his friends, who welcomed him with respect despite the jests of some stubborn people in the small town of Cor. They taunted him, calling him Mary's boy, or little Jesus. Say what you will, the seer replied. It's not for me to make you believe. And yet, from the very first day, his words began to convict souls to the point of achieving real conversions, especially his father's, upon which we must linger, although I stated that I wished only to write and brief the life story of the shepherd of La Salette. It inspired its first anonymous author to write more than 600 Wonderful Pages, a work, albeit difficult to digest, was described in Rome as an excellent work, a gregium opus. Maximum had just fallen asleep when his father came home from the tavern, where all day he had been mocking Father Selmy's account of his boy's vision. He dashed to his son's bed, woke him up abruptly, and while standing him up on his feet, ordered Maximum in his shirt and barefoot to repeat what he should have kept secret. Giraud, his father, was so upset that he did not realize that his son was speaking to him in French for the first time. He became furious when he heard these words from the apparition. Quote, if the harvest spoils, it is because of your sins. The grapes will rot, unquote. All these tirades against the beautiful lady and Maximum can be summed up in these words. Quote, in eight years, I could not teach you one Our Father, and suddenly you're the lecturer, unquote. On Monday, the wheelwright Giraud's workshop was so besieged by visitors that in the evening he discharged his bad temper on his son and forbade him to tell people such tales. 
However, before sending him to bed, he demanded that he explain to him again what he had seen and heard on Saturday at La Salette. He was trying to catch him in his lies and deceit. Maximum obeyed at once, but as on the previous day, the father, who was a habitual swearer, became angry when he heard that the crops would fail. To put an end to the outburst, the stepmother took the child aside to recite the evening's prayers and with her sent him to bed. Because of the proverb that rest and reason are companions, the next day the father resolved to keep his son locked up to teach him a lesson. All day, Tuesday, Maximum was not allowed to go out and was so closely guarded that a friend of his father had to trick his way into speaking to the young seer. On Tuesday evening, the father, whose anger had not subsided, made his son repeat what he called his, quote, lecture, and once again became angry about the poor harvest. But this time he held his peace and allowed Maximum to get to the end of the story about what the beautiful lady had said. When he heard about the incident at Kor, his eyes widened in astonishment at these words of the Blessed Virgin. Have you not seen spoiled wheat, my children? Oh, no, madam, replied Melanie. But you, my child, addressing Maximum, must have seen some once near coin with your father. The farmer said to your father, come and see how my wheat is rotting. That's true, madam. I didn't remember that. That's amazing, the wheelwright of card burst out. How could you have remembered the story from the village of Coin, which happened more than two years ago, and which no living soul around Cor could ever have known about? Hence, Giraud resolved thereafter to go and examine everything on the mountain of La Salette, and to ask the Blessed Virgin to heal his asthma as proof of her apparition. The public pilgrimage would not take place until mid-November, in the meantime, his son was now free to go out and to talk to everyone about what he had seen. Moreover, Giraud was granted his favor. Seeing that his father's asthma was getting better from the moment he began believing in the apparition, Maximum took the opportunity to ask him to make a small cross that he wanted to place in the spot where the Mother of God had appeared to him. The wheelwright did not hesitate in making a cross from white wood, one and a half meters long, which Maximum immediately took to the parish priest of Cor to bless. On October 22nd, it was already cold and snowing. Accompanied by some friends who were not inhibited by the harsh weather, Maximum carried the cross to the apparition site and erected on the spot where the beautiful lady had risen triumphantly to heaven. Some weeks later, Melanie planted her cross at the edge of the fountain where Mary had wept so much. These two crosses, planted differently, seemed to indicate the future triumph after punishment. Two weeks after his son erected the cross, Giraud, with two of his friends, managed to go up to Le Planeau, that's the plateau, the proper name of the site on the mountain in the Alps which the Mother of Savior had visited. On the way up, our three gentlemen made fun of those who believed in the miracle of La Salette. But lo and behold, as soon as they saw the cross marking the place of Mary's assumption, they fell unwittingly to their knees while trying to recite aloud the Our Father, which they had forgotten and of which they were only able to mutter a few words along with a Hail Mary. They wept and promised to convert, especially Giraud because he had truly been cured of his asthma that very day. As a result, the same evening of the pilgrimage, having returned to Cor, Giraud wanted to go to confession, but considering the late hour, 10 o'clock in the evening, his wife reasoned that it would be unwise. The very next day, Giraud went to see the parish priest and then received communion the following Sunday, after more than 20 years away from the sacraments. From that day on, he lived and died as a good Christian, and thus entrusted his son to the sisters of Cor to ensure that he would be well prepared for his first communion, which took place on May 17, 1848. In comparing that day with the day of the apparition, Maximum, gifted with a truly enlightened piety as well as notable virtues of modesty, considering his youth and the flattering compliments he had been receiving, wrote these beautiful words, 
The joy of my First Communion is different from the joy of September 19, 1846. This joy came from without, but the joy of May 7, 1848 was an entirely interior fullness. During the four years he spent at the Sisters Providence and Corps, Maximin could hardly be distinguished from the other children outwardly. He was even prone to mischief. But he was sweet and especially loving towards two sisters who served as his mothers after the death of his father in 1849. In that same year, he lost all his close relatives and only had an unscrupulous tutor who sought, although in vain, to exploit Maximum's mission. Indeed, the shepherd of La Salette overshadowed Melanie, the missionary of Mary. More sought after than the shy, discreet shepherdess, Maximin not only answered without affectation the innumerable visitors, but often had accompanied them all the way to Le Planeau, sometimes even three times in a single day. No doubt his youthful mountain-trained feet were necessary for such a sense. We will openly admit that at times Maximum escaped the drudgery of our guide by wandering off to find birds, and he would leave whomsoever behind along the way, taking unknown paths. Yes, he was playing hooky. Can we blame him? He was naturally tired of visitors. Nothing is more depressing, he wrote, than being followed by inquisitive people, gaping and gawking as though I were some prey. I want to be left alone and no longer hear people shouting, that's Maximin, when I pass by. I'd rather be alone, like a useless tool. Nothing could better depict the state of this childish soul for us than the following incident. In 1847, Bishop Villecourt of La Rochelle, and subsequently made Cardinal in Rome, wanted Mary Shepherd to accompany him from Cor to the Holy Mountain. On his way back from his pilgrimage, the prelate stopped by the presbytery of La Salette. For this occasion, the parish priest rang the church bell. While the Bishop of La Rochelle was being welcomed, Maximum climbed the bell tower and with a small stone in each hand, set the bell ringing again. It had not rung long enough. The sacristan arrived and snatched the rope to stop the racket. Unfazed, the boy grabbed onto the bell, whose sounds had been hushed, and he let himself be swung. Before the sexton had time to climb the bell tower, the little bell toller had slipped away. Despite his childish pranks, which were a providential contrast between the natural and the supernatural in his life, Our Lady of La Salette never ceased to watch over her messenger and to protect him. Amid the endless displays of respect, the congratulations, and even the enthusiasm expressed daily by visitors, the shepherd of La Salette remained aloof and indifferent. He was bored, in fact. Is this not an extraordinary grace from heaven? Even more, we can see in this child graces that are akin to a miracle. We cannot repeat enough that before the apparition, Maximum understood only a few words of French and did not speak it. He only knew the patois of Cor. From the day after the apparition, he began to speak French to his father at the Presbytery of La Salette on the evening of September 20th, and then to all the visitors who addressed him in French. This was also the case with Melanie. What a miracle! Editor's Note this is a slight exaggeration. The sisters began teaching the children French, and they advanced in their understanding. No doubt the language of the children was not perfect, but it was sufficient for their mission. With these kinds of mystical graces, God always leaves something of the natural in order to better show us his intervention. This is what I personally noticed in the spoken ecstasies of Marie Julie of La Fraude. How many mistakes she made in French when using theological and poetic language that was so sublime, so divine. 
No less astounding was the visible assistance God gave Maximum, who was obliged to indulge his thousands of listeners as he told them about the apparition, especially when he answered their unexpected objections. With unwavering enthusiasm and zeal, Mary Shepherd told his story over and over again. Yet with a surprising range of eloquence, we can apply the well-known saying about the so-called monotony of the rosary to his story. It is never repeated, for love is always new. In a leaflet published in favor of La Salette, Mr. Amade Nicholas wrote that a learned theology professor once confronted Maximin with twelve serious objections, which the child dismantled in a few words. Father Lenoud, archpriest of the Cathedral of Rouen, stated that in his presence the same child was subjected to the arguments of fifty priests who spoke in turn, one after another, and that Maximum refuted them all with such astuteness that when they were done, one exclaimed, Obviously, this is the intervention of the Blessed Virgin. While the visitors did not, or could not for lack of time due to the crowd, dare raise objections, they did subject him to many tiresome questions. Yet the visionary did not lose patience. He frequently told groups and crowds of pilgrims about the apparition without reserve. Among the listeners on July 27, 1847, let us recall the holy man of Tours, Venerable Leo Dupin, a true devotee of Our Lady of La Salette and the Holy Face, which are interconnected in their reparation of blasphemies. In order to support and encourage her messenger, the Blessed Mary made Dupont a witness in La Salette of, conver of conversions and miracles, the fruits of her heavenly manifestation on the Holy Mountain. During the summer and throughout the rest of the year, Maximin was constantly pestered by the flood of visitors from every level of society. Finally, one comment made by Maximum himself is in order. He admitted that he did not see the face of the Blessed Virgin, as well as Melanie. To him, it was as if it were veiled by a blinding light. He only saw her from a bird's eye view. However, he added, given his weak eyesight, it was a miracle he was able to hear the sound, the second Son of Heaven, for so long. Why the difference in perspective regarding Mary's features? Could it be to preach modesty to women by veiling their faces in a century in which they seek so much attention by their lavish hairstyles? In any case, the discrepancy is minimal. We may recall the evangelist who wrote the New Testament with some variations which in no way undermine the truth of their testimony, as the most knowledgeable commentators of our holy books have proven. This reflection leads us to a serious conclusion published in 1855 by Bishop Dupuch of Algiers in his work on La Salette. The testimony of the children of La Salette cannot be divided. We must accept it or reject it in its entirety. I apply this same principle to the various secrets received by the same visionaries. Therefore, when they publish them, we must believe in them as we believed in the apparition based on their word. Failing to do so would compromise logic and good faith.